Welcome to Fifth Third Bank Stadium. Atlanta United 2 lose 2-1 tonight to the OKC Energy. It's Jason, it's John, it's Jarrett from the booth with the twos review. These guys are going to talk a lot more than I am because (laughs) I've done two games today and I'm tired. Um, Atlanta United 2 looked tired as the second half went on. And it was OKC Energy who had played in the midweek. Uh, goal came in the second half early for the twos. A great one from Matias Benitez. Will Riley was instrumental in getting the whole sequence started. But from there on out, it was all OKC. They find two goals, and that's all they needed. The twos didn't have any answers. Jarrett, you spoke to Jack Collison on the postgame press conference. What did Coach have to say? Uh, Coach seemed to talk about it. Uh, said They just seemed to retreat. Um was a word he used, and then naivete was another word he used for it. He talked about, you know, they just seem to retreat, and that's the mentality that he's trying to change with this club. And, and you got to remember, with this team, it is a lot of young players. They've been playing together, but they had a short bench tonight, too, with so many young players playing with, uh, with the academy teams at tournaments. Uh, they said there's lots to learn from it, um, but also felt like they missed some chances in the final third that really could have helped them with this one. But uh, naivete was the word he kept coming back to especially late in the game, and we'll get into it. But the second half, just especially once Atlanta United 2 goes down, OKC Energy kind of took the onus of the game. And I don't want to say it got cynical, but they seem to know how to kind of prickle Atlanta under their skin enough to kind of throw them off. And Atlanta was really never able to build back into it. Two goals in about an eight-minute span. Tucker Stevenson came in as a sub, and... Stevenson came in in the 57th as a part of the, the first set of swaps from Lee Viegman. Then he gets a, a goal on the board. Great save by uh, Rocco Rios Novo, but it kicks out right to Stevenson, and he puts it in the back of the net and make it 1-1. Then eight minutes later, a set piece where uh, Rob Coronado sends it in. Great work by Connor Donovan to get it past Rios Novo, too. Uh, Connor Donovan, you know, he's, he's not the kind of individual that – you know, that, that you can miss, but, uh, you know, when you're 6'2", 180, he got through all the traffic, had a great flick and put it past Rios Nova to make it 2-1, and then from there it was uphill for Atlanta United too. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, the second goal was one you just, I mean, you can't have the first goal with the guy standing that wide open, um, you know, standing that wide open on the back post where, uh, you know, Atlanta United 2 gives a lot of space. It's a really good overlap on the right side. As Atlanta United 2 kind of gets bunkered in a bit. We talked about them retreating. Uh, you get the run on the right side. It gets a free cross in. It's a sharp, quick cross to the front post that uh, Jaime Chavez uh, of Atlanta uh, history fame, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, it's saved by Rios Novo, but it kind of squirts out the back door, and then you can't have someone stand, but stand in there on the back post all by the lonesome, and then you cannot have... As Jack Collis referred to it, one of their towers, yeah. uh, just running free, where all he had to do was just stick his foot out and redirect it into goal, and then it just kind of seemed to unravel for Atlanta. The save from Rios Novo on, on Chavez was first class. That was an incredible save um, on that initial chance, but then the follow-up, it's way too easy for Stevenson. He's got all day. The first chance shouldn't have been as easy to have it for Chavez either, but the save from Rios Novo was excellent. There's nothing he could do to push it any wider away from Stevenson. He's just got to be picked up. I was so impressed with Rios Novo, not just on that save, and but as we've watched him be on, I know he became a cult hero against Alawense. I get it. I still want to put stick him on his gloves from that series alone. I'm so impressed with what we have seen from him, however, in the way he commands his box in the way he is so willing to make himself an option for his defense Mm -hmm. to take the pressure off of Because this is a young group. I mean, Bauer is the oldest guy out here, and he just graduated college and just came in through the draft. And then you have George Campbell back there. And at times, especially when you have Caleb Wiley getting forward, it's Bryce Washington who just graduated and signed as a homegrown. You've got a really young back line out there. He's been making himself an option. He's putting himself out there. I'm really impressed with the way he – commands things in a pretty mature way. He was 35 of 37 passing today, Rocco Rios Novo. Of course he was. The only two missed passes were long balls that he hit that were three of five. He didn't hit very many of those. 
uh, stepping up to join the play. Yeah, it's a, it's a big part of his game. He also made six saves in the match, uh, the majority of those coming in the second half. Rios Novo was excellent. Um, let's go through the back line a, a little bit because Bryce Washington got another start at right back. It was Bauer and it was Campbell to start with, and it was Caleb Wiley on the left side. Um, I thought I thought Campbell was really good at times. Campbell got forward and was involved in nearly creating a, a goal of the week candidate, and we'll get into that here in a minute. Oh, buddy. Uh, but Campbell was 53 of 57 passing. He was 6 of 6 on the long ball. That's something that he has improved dramatically in, in his game. He had an interception. He had a tackle. He stepped up into the attack. I thought George Campbell was excellent. I thought Josh Bauer was really good. Uh, 84% passing. A couple of long balls got a little dicey from him, but I like Bauer trying to force the play, and he, he doesn't have unnecessary risk at times. Um, on the right side, Bryce Washington, he, he played center back primarily at Pitt. He won four tackles in this one. He was 83% on his passing, 45 of 54. He also had an interception to go with those four tackles. Bryce is still a work in progress as a right back. You could hear Jack Collison yelling at him consistently to stay wide. He, he wants to come in centrally because he's played as a center back most of his career. I get it, but in, in that attacking half, he's got to stay wide and provide that width. He's a little bit better on the ball than maybe we thought in those moments because being a, a converted center back, he's fine with receiving the ball in tight spaces. Wiley was great. Um, I thought Wiley was, was really, really good tonight. He played a little bit of left wing as, as the subs were moving around, 85% of the ball. He was good getting forward as well. Uh, Wiley had a couple of interceptions and a tackle. John, who stood out to you out of the defenders? Out of the defenders, obviously Caleb Wiley. I'll, I will second that one. I'm, you know, you look at Bauer as well. We talked about Campbell with his moments and just being able to watch Bryce Washington continue to become acquainted with what's uh, asked of him with Atlanta United, whether it's you know with the twos these last two matches or Monday through Sunday at practice as well. Uh, Jared, one of the other guys that I wanted to, to catch up with you about was Will Riley as we work into the midfield. What was the uh, the discussion about Will Riley after the match from Jack Collison? Well, Will Riley had a really unique match. I mean, it was very up and down, which he's a young player. You're going to get that. Last time out in Memphis, uh, Will Riley gets, you're in a situation where Atlanta's already down a man. Will Riley picks up a yellow on a professional foul, plays the rest of the game on a nice edge, and had a really, really good game. Tonight, he had a couple misplaced passes. He also completed a beautiful turn that helped trigger the goal for Atlanta United 2, where he collects the ball, turns perfectly on, let's call it an imperfect pitch tonight, plays the ball to Mertz, and then Mertz perfectly weights the ball to Benitez. Um, but there were some moments that he's going to want to improve on. Coach Collison called Will Riley brave and fearless. Uh, he said, you know, talked about you saw the quality in that goal of what he can give you in the midfield. He said, I have no doubt that Will Riley will be out there again on Wednesday and will probably be one of the best players on the pitch. He had nothing but good things to say about what Riley is capable of. And I think we've seen that and seen the growth. And one thing that stuck out to me, Jason, about Will Riley is tonight there was a ball. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know if I can't remember if it was a long ball or just a ball that popped up in the air. Riley went up for a header, won it, kept his feet. And to me, that's not something he does last year. He's gotten stronger, but not just that. His balance and his composure is just so improved to be able to win those balls in the midfield and to take uh, and to take some of those duels for Atlanta United. Yeah, he was pretty good on the duels. Uh, one of three in the air, which isn't his strong suit, but five of eight on the ground. He was fouled three times. He had a couple of strong defensive plays with winning a couple of tackles as well. 81% on the passing side. Uh, I think the, the bravery showed in that sequence that led to the goal for Atlanta because he'd had a couple of poor plays before that. And it was a, a spot where they were pretty well covered if it didn't come off, but it was a, a little bit of a, a risk-reward balance. And Riley went for it because he's playing with so much more confidence. I think last year when we saw Will Riley, uh, it was a lot of safe play. Which is good, especially for a young player, you know, finding their footing. But this year, he's being asked to do more and be more influential, and I think we're starting to see it. 
I hope he is one of the best players on the pitch on, on Wednesday because that's a quick turn to Birmingham, and it's not a huge squad at the moment. The first team is coming off of a busy week. I'm not sure how many guys are going to be able to make that trip to Birmingham with them. The academy kids were all involved in MLS Next, so I'm not sure how many of them are going to be back and willing to make that trip and able to make that trip. So Riley's going to be asked to do a lot over there as well. Uh, the midfield partners with him, and, and John, I want to ask you about one of them specifically. Chris Allen was the Chris Allen that we kind of expect at this point. He yep. created a couple of chances, yep. 87% of passing. But I want to ask you about Robbie Mertz. Okay. Uh, you know, you look at, at Robbie Mertz, and you know we talked about it on the broadcast, where Robbie Mertz is that veteran presence. And we've seen him in other uniforms in USL Championship. And he came here because, as has been discussed, you, you want to seize an opportunity for yourself to be looked at by a club like Atlanta United. You do well with Atlanta United, too, and you can earn yourself possibly a spot with, with the first team. And I think that having that veteran presence like Robbie Mertz out there, I think it's it's a calming influence for all of the younger guys. And, and Mertz isn't afraid to sit there, Jarrett, and and encourage them to, to do things one way or the other, to sit there and direct a little traffic. There was a reason he was wearing the armband out there tonight, and I thought that he handled himself very, very well as that veteran presence in the midfield. It, I think so as well, and it's also a situation for him where he talked about the chemistry on this team improving, and I think he, he guys like he and Chris Allen can play a role in that. Um, you know, They're a little bit older, and they're a little more experienced in different ways. Uh, you know, Allen coming out of you know, being out of, out of the academy in England and spending time there and, and being a little bit older, a little bit, you know, more worldwide, I guess, if you want to call it that. And then you've got a guy like Mertz, who might as well be a veteran at this league, at spending some time at Pittsburgh. You know, he's seen different things, chem, uh, you know, chemistry-wise, that have developed and needed to develop. Um, so tonight, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just one of those games that is going to sting, though. Uh you know, see that they they identified this as three big points going forward. Um, but it's a young team, and he knows they're going to have to show resilience. Um, but I know he was also very happy about you know the team's overall you know performance so far going forward, um, especially with the goal being able to put everything together in the run of play. It wasn't a set piece, and they took a lot of pride in the fact that they're able to play through a veteran team like OKC. And even even an OKC team that might be getting the interim manager bump, it's still a very talented team, and I don't mean to take away from OKC's talent, but there ha- there should absolutely, in my opinion, be a notch in the belt for playing through a veteran team with a bunch of young players like that and being able to create a goal you know, through the run of play like they did. Yeah, to a degree. Um, but the, the response after that was a problem, and, yes. and we'll, get, we'll come back to that here. Uh, the front three, I thought Connor Stanley really struggled to find a, a mark on the match. Um, maybe the worst night we've seen from him. Again, he's a young player. These things happen, but he was struggling on the dribble, uh, did work hard defensively, and that's the good thing out of Stanley is you get an honest shift out of him every single time. But he wasn't very influential in the attack. Benitez had the goal. We'll come back to him. I thought Darwin Mateus, in his time on the pitch, he wasn't able to finish it. He came out in the 62nd minute for Bradley Camden Feo. I thought Darwin Mateus was possibly the best we've seen him. Uh, Created a number of chances. I thought he was very dangerous throughout. He hit the woodwork once. Uh, Mateus was really good, and I thought a little more... A little more urgent at times than we've seen him this season, John. Yeah, and that's what you're you're looking for as a part of this growth. Yes, I know that we're, you know, just short of the one third mark when it comes to the season, but you're looking for progression in players and their growth. And I think that when you see what you saw tonight, where he was active offensively, engaged defensively, and you know, doubling back and making sure that he was engaged in, in trying to prevent OKC energy from doing things. I think that, you know, what we've seen from the evolution of Stanley Mateus and Benitez up top, I think that this is just another one of those stages where you can sit there, Jarrett, and go, okay, there's steps forward that have been made here in a night like this. Yeah, Darrell Mateus was really fun tonight. Um, should have had goal of the week, probably, in USL. Um, you know, we've, we've po- I've, I know I posted it and the team posted it. You have a... Scissor kick, I guess you want to call it. 
that he just burns into the back of the net that is called for a foul because God only knows why. I guess George Campbell uh, breathed on somebody the wrong way, but unfortunately, it's it doesn't count, and you end up with a situation where you know. Atlanta United 2 misses out on a goal, but I appreciate that the moment, they didn't let that get to them. Now, we right. can talk about them absolutely going to pieces if you want to. Is that, is that too harsh to say at the end of the game? Um, I, no, because I don't think they emotionally went to pieces. I, I just don't know where the, the initiative was after they got the lead. It, it felt like at that point... OKC grabbed it and didn't let go of it. And, That's a fair point. Yeah. And, and look, there, there wasn't a whole lot on the bench for uh, the team either tonight. Uh, Bradley Camden Feo came on for Mateus. It was a little odd because that moved Caleb Wiley into an attacking role from left back. And then with another shift later when Campbell came off, as I think he ran out of gas, it looked like. Yeah. Um, it was a, a struggle because Alexander Garuba came on. He brought some energy, but that was all that was available. Aiden McFadden was on the bench, but he'd taken a knock. He's 50-50. There, there wasn't the ability to really risk it with him with the games coming up. Hopefully he'll be available for Wednesday. And, and there just wasn't anybody else. I, I know one of the questions from, from one of the Hardcore Twos fans out there on Twitter, uh, Colin Martz, was, you know, why is somebody like that on the bench? I don't think there was anybody else to put on the bench. I don't think he took anybody's spot because there were open spots. I think it was, you know, just basically like well, he was we hope good. maybe you can stand out there, and you probably went through the warm up, and it wasn't good enough to be used. Yeah, I think he put. I think you put him on the sheet because you don't have anyone else. Yeah, and he was fifty fifty, and going through warm ups, I think it was a situation of. You know, we put him out there. He's not going to be able to play at game speed, so we're not going to we're going to sit him for another game to make sure he's okay and not risk his long term health. Fifty fifty is better than an empty spot. Yes, you know, that's basically yeah. where it's at. So again, you know, as I mentioned, it's a busy time with the MLS Next Cup playoffs and then the first team playing three games this week. I thought it showed with the twos lack of options off the bench. We'll see if that changes for the midweek. Uh, Jared, I believe you wanted to get into the referee tonight. Um, it was his. Salty? It was his first uh, game in USL Championship this season. He had done four last year and won the year before. Um, he struggled to control this one at times. He did. It was a Jervis Adagana. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Just genuinely hope I am. Um, there were yeah there there were moments of this game that I had an issue with in terms of you know you have the the goal called back on the scissor kick because of the foul called on George Campbell still not sure why um, you know uh, you know Benitez hits the post on a free kick in the second half for Atlanta United two on a play that was a foul rule at the edge of the eighteen that was about a foot or two inside the eighteen and should have been a penalty for Atlanta United two and was not given. That's unacceptable to me. That's absolutely unacceptable. Aside from that, you know, what got me was late in the game, just the way it was controlled where you have Stevenson who, to Stevenson's credit for Oklahoma City, Stevenson understood how the game was being called and went down easy a couple times and got calls and, you know, kind of was able to kind of drag things out a bit. Oklahoma City was able to drag things out a bit, and it just felt like the game kind of got out of control and the, and the ref just wasn't able to get it under control, and it got out of control a little too easily. Yeah, you take what the ref's going to give you. And, yeah. and he gave a, a lot in terms of, of some of the shenanigans there was a, a sequence where Stevenson got a free kick in, in the second incident, uh, no call on Connor Stanley having it tackled away from him, which I think was the right call seeing it on the replay. But the, the one that Stevenson earned a free kick on, there was nothing in it. The, the second free kick that he earned, there was even less in it. The goal that was taken off the board, he did blow the whistle decisively very quickly. Uh, Campbell has his arm up against the back of uh, one of the Oklahoma City defenders, but it didn't look like he shoved him, and it really wasn't even sold that hard as a possible foul, and, and it was given. The penalty, I really don't know how it was missed. Yeah. Um, where we, The angle we have watching it live, I couldn't tell if it was inside or outside the box from where we were. 
Uh, he was right there. The referee was, you know, maybe two, three yards away from the incident, and it's really clear watching the replay. And there's no VAR in USL Championship, but Benitez had gotten into the 18 and was cutting back out, and the foul happened at a minimum with him over the line. At a minimum, I I really have no idea how that's not a penalty. Uh, Benitez did take the free kick. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, we're looking at a still shot of it. At a minimum, he's on top of the line when it happens, and that's a, a penalty. Um, should have been a penalty. He takes the free kick. He puts it off the bar. That should have been an opportunity. The goal being called back was a very difficult call to make. There's a little bit of contact. There is. I mean, Campbell does have his arm out, but it wasn't even really sold hard. And, you know, these things happen. Um, the management of the game with some of the things at the end was maybe the biggest glaring issue. But as we've talked about in this league, as we've talked about in general, the referees, you have a lot of young referees who are on the way up, which is a good thing. And they're getting some games uh, at levels that maybe are a challenge for them and, and some matches that are a challenge because not every two matches are, are made the same. So I thought it was a struggle for the referee tonight. Um there's going to be some calls that I think he'll watch back and he'll wish that he had an opportunity to do it again and just hopefully it's better next time. Well, and then you have the the conversation that he had late with Bradley Camden Fayo in the corner. Well, that's just bad game management because right. at that point in stoppage time, one, Bradley Camden Fayo needs to not be in that conversation when it's clear that the referee wants to engage in the conversation and keep going. Um, I don't know why that's an ongoing conversation at that point. It, it really didn't make any points. It didn't gain any control of the match. There's three minutes roughly left. It, it felt like it was adding to some of the time wasting, and it was just unnecessary. Yeah. But again, these are the things that young referees will learn. Young referees want to try to stamp their authority on a match, which they absolutely need to do, but by the time you're in the stoppage time portion of it, you're not going to stamp any more authority on it. Just let it go and let the play go. Yep, and so you, you hope that for an official like Jervis Adegan, it's a learning experience. Absolutely. As, as he continues, as he looks back at what happened with situations and game management and things like that. But, yeah, there were a couple of uh, instances where, you know, it should have been different, especially the, the penalty that was called just outside the box when it should have been inside the box. I think it is tempting to look at that, though, and I, I know no one on that team will say it, so I'll do it for you. I'm curious how that game looks different if it's 2 nothing for Atlanta United, too, because on a short rest, if you're Oklahoma City and you're down one nothing, you find that gear. I'm curious if they find that gear if they're down 2 nothing after that penalty, but we'll never know. It is what it is, and yeah, I hope it is a growth experience for him because... You know, we talk about players growing. I think you can look back at the mistakes made tonight if you're the official and get better from it. And you know, hopefully, next time you see him out here, he's better at controlling the game. You know, he's he's having hopefully a perfect night calling the game. You know, don't wish any ill on any of them. It just it was a rough night. I thought for him. Yeah, I thought he I thought he struggled. Um, it didn't affect the result by any no. stretch at all. Even with the penalty situation, uh, Atlanta United to had control, especially early in the second half. They came out of the locker room uh, in great form uh, with great play and got the lead, and then it felt like they took their foot off the gas and got out of the car, Mm -hmm. and that's the problem here. Uh, Three straight without a win for Atlanta United 2. OKC Energy on the flip side, three straight wins. Um, three straight one-goal wins. Uh, Lee Viedman with his interim tag that, that might be turning into a permanent tag, at least for the rest of the season. But three straight without a win for Atlanta United 2, and it's not going to be easy as they head west a couple of hours to face the Birmingham Legion on Wednesday. Who have really caught fire recently, and they're at the, the top of the division. And Nico Brent, seven goals on the season for Birmingham, and uh, – you know the. I think that really the first thing that look that you look at is just the, the growth that Birmingham has had. They've kind of grown into the season, and they are they are really right now at the top of their game. It's going to be a tough test, especially when it's midweek. This is Sunday night as we're talking. You have Monday, Tuesday, bus travel over probably three hours with breaks and what have you. 
then you go and play, and then you drive back. So it's going to be a, a tall order for Atlanta United 2 on a very, very short turnaround against the team at the top of the division. I hope they're not stopping at the rest area at the state line. No. 59% possession for Atlanta United 2 tonight. Shot 17-15 to 15 in OKC's favor, 8-4 to 4 on target. Fouls 16 to 11, Atlanta United 2 committed more. 80, 85% passing for the two, 78% passing for OKC. The duels really shifted in the second half, 54 to 40 for OKC. And that, that tells you everything you need to know about how the second half of this game went. The Central Division, as we stand at the end of the weekend, Birmingham on 19 points through 10, Lou City on 17 points through 9. Tulsa on 15 points through nine. They've won two of their last three as they start to bounce back. Indy 11, 14 points through 10. Those are the four above the playoff line. OKC leapfrogs Atlanta United 2 into fifth place, 13 points through 11. The twos have 12 points through 10. Sporting Kansas City 2 has 10 points through 12. And Memphis 901, they've only played eight games, but they only have eight points. They've lost their last two after beating the twos a week and a half ago. So we'll have a watch along on Wednesday for the Atlanta Birmingham match. You can watch on Twitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. We'll be back tomorrow, usual time, 9 a.m. again on Twitch for our normal overreaction Monday show. You can overreact to the twos. You can overreact to a scoreless draw for Atlanta United and Red Bull New York. You can overreact to a red card for the Netherlands, knocking them out of the Euros couple of goals from the Czech Republic involved in that as well. You can overreact to Belgium advancing and anything else from the weekend you want to get into. We'll be there at 9 a.m. on Twitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. Thanks for listening to the latest twos review. We're out.